Please turn your Bibles to the last chapter of the book of Acts, Acts chapter 28, and we begin this morning at verse 11. Acts chapter 28, and at verse 11, through to the end of the chapter. Let us hear the word of God. After three months, we put out to sea in a ship that had wintered in the island. It was an Alexandrian ship with the figurehead of the twin gods Castor and Pollux. We put in at Syracuse and stayed there three days. From there, we set sail and arrived at Regium. The next day, the south wind came up, and on the following day, we reached Putaloni. There we found some brothers who invited us to spend a week with them. And so we came to Rome. The brothers there had heard that we were coming and they traveled as far as the Forum of Appius and the three taverns to meet us. At the sight of these men, Paul thanked God and was encouraged When we got to Rome, Paul was allowed to live by himself with a soldier to guard him. Three days later, he called together the leaders of the Jews. When they had assembled, Paul said to them, My brothers, although I have done nothing against our people or against the customs of our ancestors, I was arrested in Jerusalem and handed over to the Romans. They examined me and wanted to release me, because I was not guilty of any crime deserving death. But when the Jews objected, I was compelled to appeal to Caesar, not that I had any charge to bring against my own people. For this reason I have asked to see you and talk with you. It is because of the hope of Israel that I am bound with this chain. They replied, We have not received any letters from Judea concerning you, and none of the brothers who have come from there has reported or said anything bad about you. But we want to hear what your views are, for we know that people everywhere are talking against this sect. They arranged to meet Paul on a certain day and came in even larger numbers to the place where he was staying. From morning till evening, he explained and declared to them the kingdom of God and tried to convince them about Jesus from the law of Moses and from the prophets. Some were convinced by what he said, but others would not believe. They disagreed among themselves and began to leave after Paul had made this final statement. The Holy Spirit spoke the truth to your forefathers when he said through Isaiah the prophet go to this people and say you will be ever hearing but never understanding you will be ever seeing but never perceiving for this people's heart has become calloused they hardly hear with their ears they have closed their eyes otherwise they might see with their eyes hear with their ears understand with their hearts and turn and I would heal them Therefore, I want you to know that God's salvation has been sent to the Gentiles and they will listen. For two whole years, Paul stayed there in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to see him. Boldly and without hindrance, he preached the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen, and God will bless his word to us today. Well, it's taken us 18 months and 45 sermons, but today we've arrived, the last verses of the last chapter, the end of the book of Acts. But it's not much of an ending, is it? Most books end with the solution to the mystery. 
or with the climax of the story, or at least with a final and happy ending. <clears throat> but not acts. The story just seems to tail off, doesn't it? We'd love to know what happened to Paul and to Luke. Was he released after these two years that are mentioned in verse 30? Or was he killed? We're just kept hanging, wondering what, what comes next. <clears throat> it's as if the book ends not with a full stop, but with a dotted line. It's a bit like the book of the prophet Jonah which also ends rather abruptly, leaving many unanswered questions about the state of Jonah's faith, about the implications of God's grace towards Nineveh for the Gentile world. But this open-endedness in both Jonah and Acts is, I suggest, quite deliberate. God didn't want either of these accounts to be concluded with a fully rounded finale or with a sentimental happy ending. He intended rather to leave us with what are essentially unfinished stories. And they are unfinished because the work of God remains unfinished and the preaching of the gospel must go on until the Lord returns at the end of the age. Having said that, these final verses are significant. The book of Acts begins, and we were reminded in our call to worship this morning, begins with Jesus on the day of the ascension telling his disciples that they would receive power when the Holy Spirit came on them and they would be his witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and then on to the ends of the earth. In the second chapter, the Holy Spirit came upon them. And immediately they began witnessing in Jerusalem. And then, mainly because of persecution, they were radiated out throughout Judea and Samaria and on to the ends of the known earth. But why are these final verses significant? Well, because it seems to me they underline several lessons, lessons that have been repeated throughout the book of Acts, lessons that we need to grasp and hold on to today. And this morning I want to draw out three of these lessons. First of all, there's a reminder here in these verses of the witness's message. The witness's message. It's in Verses 17 to 23, I'm thinking of particularly. Paul arrived in Rome. He was met by the brothers, by the fellow Christians, and he was encouraged. But then, verse 17, three days later, he called together the leaders of the Jews. And they came to meet with him. Now, when you think about all that had transpired between Paul and the Jewish leaders over the years. Isn't it remarkable that Paul should want to meet them so quickly and that they should accept his invitation? Paul knew, of course, that he had to be Christ's witness and that, first of all, to the Jews. And so he took the initiative. On the other hand, he wasn't obnoxious. He was completely honest about the circumstances that had brought him to Rome. He told them that he'd done nothing against their or his people and ancestral customs. He told them that his appeal to Caesar was to secure his release, that he had no hidden agendas. He had no charge to bring against his people. It wasn't for revenge or against the Sanhedrin. 
but neither was it for his legal vindication or personal freedom. He says it was on account of the hope of Israel that he was in chains. Now, the hope of Israel was, of course, the promise of the Messiah in the Old Testament. Paul was saying he really was a true Jew, a believer in the Messiah, and that he was in Rome not represented a weird new heresy, but actually serving God. Surprisingly, the Jewish leaders hadn't received any letters or reports from Judea about, about Paul. They were keen to hear him, and they returned, it says, in even greater numbers to where he was staying. And for that whole day, from morning to evening, Paul spoke to them. Now, what was his message? Well, look at verse 23. He explained and declared to them the kingdom of God and tried to convince them about Jesus from the law of Moses and from the prophets. Paul's message to these Jewish believers was an explanation and declaration of the kingdom of God and an attempt to convince them about Jesus from their scriptures. Just look on to the very last verse, verse 31, where Luke gives us a summary of Paul's message during the next two years when he welcomed all who came to him. Presumably, mainly Gentiles. Look what he says. He preached the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ. So there were two elements in Paul's message. The kingdom of God, God's active rule in people's lives, and Jesus, the long-promised Messiah, the King, the Lord Jesus Christ. It was, in effect, one message, wasn't it? That the kingdom of God had come in the person of Jesus, the promised king. Now, Jesus had commissioned the disciples to be his witnesses, to witness about him. And here's Paul doing just that. Now, that message of God's kingdom coming in Jesus, the promised King, the Lord, is the consistent message throughout Acts. On the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem, in the synagogue at Thessalonica, by the riverside in Philippi, before the philosophers in Athens, it's the same message. Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is the King. That's the consistent message throughout Acts. Now, of course, of course, that must include Jesus coming into this world as one of us. Jesus' death on the cross in our place, bearing our sins. Jesus' resurrection conquering sin and death and the devil. Jesus coming again in power and glory. These were the ways that he is the king in God's kingdom. The Lord Jesus Christ. He is the message of the witnesses. And he is our message today, isn't he? I take it we're all clear about that, aren't we? And if you've just happened to drift into church this morning and you're not a Christian, our message isn't about the church. Our message isn't about all the benefits that you'll gain by becoming a Christian. A message isn't about the state of the world and, and how to solve its ills. 
Our message is Jesus. Who he is, what he came to do, what it means to follow him. Jesus, the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's the message. Are you Christians clear of that? When people ask you this week, where were you yesterday? We just talk about the church, your friends, or will we speak about Jesus? This is the message of the witnesses. Secondly, we have a reminder in these verses of the people's response to that message. The people's response. It's in verses 24 to 28. Some, verse 24, some were convinced by what he said, but others would not believe. Now, although it doesn't say in as many words, I like to think that those who were convinced did believe. They did accept that Jesus was the Christ. They did put their trust into him. And by so doing, did become Christians. You see, there was a two-fold response to the message of Christ. Some accepted and believed. Some refused to believe. And that's always the way. That has been the response consistently through the book of Acts. In fact, verse 25 tells us that those who would not believe disagreed among themselves. The message of Christ always divides. But notice that isn't all. Paul has something to say about their response And he says it in what are his last words in the book of Acts. His final statement is how Luke describes it in verse 25. His final statement. This is it. The Holy Spirit spoke the truth to your forefathers when he said through Isaiah the prophet, Go to this people and say, You'll be ever hearing but never understanding. You'll be ever seeing but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears. They have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn, and I would heal them. Therefore, I want you to know that God's salvation has been sent to the Gentiles, and they will listen. What's Paul doing? By quoting words spoken to their forefathers in Isaiah's day, words which, in fact, Jesus quoted to his unbelieving contemporaries, Matthew chapter 13, Paul is drawing a distinction between hearing and understanding, between seeing and perceiving. What he's saying is that they will hear and see, but they don't understand because because they had deliberately hardened their hearts and closed their ears and closed their eyes. They're putting themselves in the same category as their unbelieving ancestors who repeatedly rejected the prophets and were themselves finally rejected by God for their hardness of heart. And it was because of their deliberate rejection of the gospel that Paul wanted them to know that God's salvation had been sent to the Gentiles. Now, three times before in Acts, because of this stubborn Jewish opposition, Paul had turned to the Gentiles. Chapter 13, verse 4 in Pisidian Antioch, 18, verse 6 in Corinth, 19, 8 and 9 in Ephesus. Now, for the fourth time in the world's capital city, he does it again in a quite decisive way. Now, here's something 
that is so important. This is why I think Luke records it as Paul's final statement. If people continually refuse to listen, there comes a time when they can't hear. If people continually refuse to look, there comes a time when they can't see. When I was a young chap, at the edge of this young fellow down here, I remember visiting my great grandmother's sister. I think she was, I'm never very good at relations, but she was something like that. She was, she was very old. And she'd been confined to bed for years. Now, I don't know what was wrong with her. But all I knew was that she couldn't get up. She was in bed. Now, I suppose if you took to your bed for several months, you wouldn't be able to get up. There'd be so much muscle wastage. Well, it's the same spiritually. Persistent refusal to listen leads to permanent inability to hear. Persistent refusal to look leads to permanent inability to see. You know, the really alarming thing, and I, please listen to this, the really alarming thing is this. It's Jews, it's the Jews to whom Paul is speaking. It's to people who were very religious people. It was people who had their Bibles, their Old Testaments, who knew them so well. It's these people whose hearts had become so hardened Now, that's the danger for church people today. Yes, we know all the stories about Jesus. We know our Bibles. But our hearts can be so hardened that we are not following him. And the danger is that we won't be able to to follow him. There are always two responses to the message of Christ. Acceptance or rejection. Those who accept and believe are saved. Those who reject, those who continue to reject will find that there comes a day when they cannot respond. Very solemn, isn't it? That's Paul's last word in the book of Acts. And we need to heed it well. But there's a third reminder here in these closing verses, another lesson that's been repeated through the book of Acts. And it's a reminder of God's sovereignty. A reminder that God is in control of his work. And I refer here to two verses, verse 14 and verse 31. Verse 14, first of all, we have these words, And so we came to Rome. Six little words, but full of significance. Back in chapter 19, when he was in Ephesus, Paul had said, I must visit Rome. A couple of years later, he wrote his letter to the Romans. And in that letter, he said he was praying that the way will open up for him to come to them. A few months later, he went to Jerusalem. Within a week, he was arrested, supposedly for causing a riot. The second night in custody, the Lord told him that he must testify about him in Rome. Well, it's clear, isn't it? 
He wanted to go to Rome. He was praying about going to Rome. The Lord said, you're going to Rome. And yet, for the next two years, he was held in custody. In Jerusalem, then in Caesarea. He endured several trials. An assassination attempt. Eventually, when he was sent to Rome, he was he nearly drowned. He was almost killed by the soldiers. He was poisoned almost by a snake. It seemed that everything was against him getting to Rome. But nothing could stop him. And so we came to Rome. Well, we've seen similar things at the beginning of the book of Acts, haven't we? There was opposition, first of all, from the religious authorities who tried to ban the apostles speaking about Jesus. Then, it was lies within the fellowship, in the case of Ananias and Sapphira. Then it was grumbling in the fellowship about the distribution of food to the widows. Then it was outright opposition after Stephen was killed. All these ways of trying to stop the apostles spreading the good news. Yet for all that opposition, the work went on. The word of God spread. The church grew. And so here, at the end of the book, everything seemed against Paul getting to Rome, but he got there. The Lord had said he would testify in Rome, and testify in Rome he did. God always keeps his word because he is in control. Then look at verse 31, the very last verse of this book. Actually, the order uh, of the NIV is wrong here. It should read, Paul preached the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ boldly and without hindrance. Without hindrance is the way the book ends. Yeah, but you see, isn't Paul under house arrest, guarded by a soldier, awaiting to trial before Caesar? Yes, he is. But look what Luke says in the previous verse. He welcomed all who came to see him. It seems there are no restrictions. He couldn't go to them, but they could come to him, and come they did. And they could stay as long as they liked. What Bible studies they must have had, eh? What a help Paul must have been to these young Christians. What an opportunity for them to bring their friends along to this man who had nothing else to do but answer their questions. And what about the soldiers whose job it was to guard Paul on this rota basis? Maybe a different soldier every time. Well, they'd soon get fed up about talking about the weather, wouldn't they? they'd start talking about things that were really on their minds. And this Roman citizen would listen and would counsel them. They'd soon be talking about the reason for Paul being there under house arrest. They'd soon be talking about Jesus and what he could do for them. Actually, Paul himself tells us in his letter to the Philippians that as a result of him being in chains, the whole palace guard knew that he was in chains for Christ. Now, we don't know how many of them actually became Christians, but they all knew about Jesus. And the mention of that letter to the Philippians reminds us that it was in those two years under arrest in Rome that he wrote the letters to the Ephesians, the Philippians, and the Colossians. 
And you know, there's something distinctive and special about these prison letters. Listen to what, listen to what John Stott writes. The three main prison letters set forth more powerfully than anywhere else the supreme, sovereign, undisputed, and unrivaled lordship of Jesus Christ. The person and work of Christ are given cosmic proportions. For Christ created all things, for God created all things through Christ and has reconciled all things through Christ. The fullness of the Godhead which dwelt in Christ has also worked through him. Christ is the agent of all God's work of creation and redemption. In addition, having humbled himself to the cross, God has highly exalted him. All three prison letters say so. God has given him the name or rank above all others. All things have been put under his feet. It is God's will that in everything he might have the supremacy. What a blessing these letters have been to Christian believers for nearly 2,000 years. To us, these last Sunday nights, as we've been looking at Ephesians. You see, the teaching about the Lord Jesus was spreading without hindrance. God was seeing to that. It was spreading in Rome. It was spreading through the palace guard. It was spreading down the centuries. And so here in these two verses, we have a clear reminder of God's sovereignty. Yes, Paul, Paul might be shut in, but his mouth was open. One hand might be chained to a soldier. The other was free to write. And the gospel continued to spread to the ends of the earth. The fact of God's sovereignty is something something we really do need to be constantly reminded of today. God is in charge. God knows what he's doing. And whilst the evil one will try different ways to stop the spread of the gospel, we need to remember he's defeated. There will be times, doubtless, when we we don't understand what's happening in our lives. We need to remember that God knows. And he can use the most unlikely circumstances to his glory. Well, here are three lessons. Lessons that have been brought to our attention several times through the book, but are underlined for us in these final verses. The witness's message is all about Jesus. The people's response is either to accept or to reject him. And persistent rejection leads to permanent inability to accept. And God's sovereignty is clearly evident. I said at the beginning that the book of Acts is unfinished because the work of the disciples being witnesses to Christ to the ends of the earth is unfinished. That's the work we are involved in today. Isn't it? So just imagine, just imagine that Luke was still alive. And every few years, he wrote another chapter of the book of Acts. I wonder what the chapter of Acts about the early years of the 21st century in Glasgow city centre would look like. Will it say the believers in St. George's Tron taught about the Lord Jesus Christ? A large number came to listen. Some were convinced. Some would not believe and began arguing among themselves. The Lord, in remarkable ways, opened doors, silenced opposition, and even when they thought nothing was happening, the Lord was at work building his church. Well, please God, it will say that. 
The book of Acts was written to encourage the church in every age to be faithful to the Lord, to carry the gospel to the ends of the earth. I close with what the famous preacher Charles Spurgeon had to say. What was begun with so much heroism ought to be continued with ardent zeal since we are assured that the same Lord is mighty still to carry on his heavenly designs. Well, are we going to continue carried on with ardent zeal? Please, God, we will. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Father, thank you so much for this wonderful book of Acts from which we've learned so much over these past months. Thank you that Jesus is the King in your kingdom. Help us to proclaim him, to witness to him every day. Lord, save us from that hardness of heart. Prevent us from hearing your word. And not acting upon it. Pray that many in this city centre will respond in acceptance and trust in Christ. And Father, we thank you that the spread of the gospel, the growth of the church, is your work under your supervision. Help us. Help us then to trust you that having begun a good work, you will bring it to completion. Having made promises, you always keep them. And Lord, give us that ardent zeal to continue in your wonderful service. We pray this together in Jesus' name. Amen.